We are in a series entitled Downsizing God. And the Western world is promoting a domesticated view of God. And our world is reducing him to a God that they completely understand, who will always do what they expect him to do. And because this is really their perspective, you know, it's about God blessing what you happen to be doing and and God is just all about abundance and increase and it's you never have struggles or suffering and uh, it's just really not the God of the Bible. And so we have talked about how God is so much bigger than we can understand. We've talked about the fear of the Lord and uh, we've learned that we can't reduce him. Truly, we can't. We can, we can downsize our perspective of God, but uh, really you can't downsize God. But today, we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God the sovereignty of God. And I just pray that this message will be a blessing to you in your life and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, your word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Your word does not need a defender, only an investigator. Everything that we need, Lord, is found in your word. The revelation, the understanding, Lord, to truly have a powerful, saving relationship with you is found there. I pray that you'll help us to expand our thinking and have hearts to receive maybe even some difficult truths tonight. Lord, you are so marvelous, so magnificent, so far beyond our understanding. Help us, God, to to receive this tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Let's get started by discussing what the word sovereign means. Sovereign is someone who is the supreme power, so much so that they have absolute control. They have absolute control. To be sovereign is to be without equal. Someone who has this ultimate authority is without limits, so they are absolutely free. I've heard of people claiming that they were sovereign citizens while they were being arrested. It doesn't seem to work. And I think it's a bit of a stretch to use that word. I'm a sovereign citizen. I can do what I want. Yeah? Watch this, you know? And so it doesn't work like that. But the conversation of God, when we say that God is sovereign, that is not a stretch. It's the only case in which that word is appropriate, where it perfectly applies, because only God, is the sole sovereign authority in the world, in the universe, in eternity. Before there was anything, before there was a world, before there was heaven, there was God. And God was, always has been, always will be infinite, all-powerful, self-sufficient, holy, just, and loving. So he is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. The sovereignty of God is that which separates God from all others. He is truly Lord of lords. He is king above all kings. And the Bible says that there's no end to the increase of his government. Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 through 11. And as I'm reading, I just want you to know that the Bible provides the true revelation of who God really is. Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. God is saying I'm in a class all by myself. He says I am God. This is a clarifying statement. And I wonder if God's not just responding to some people who are acting like he's not. And he's saying I am, I am God. Verse 10, declaring the end from God. The beginning. That, just stop and think about that for a moment. He declares the end from the beginning. So he's already on the other side of human history. What we call future, he's there. He, he transcends time. He's an eternal God. And he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. So he says, I declare how things are going to happen before they happen. I declare things that haven't been done yet. And he says, saying, my counsel shall stand. What I say is law. 
What I say is going to happen is going to happen. And I will do all my pleasure or purpose. So when he declares it, it's as good as done. He said it, it's going to happen. He will accomplish what he purposes to do. So God plans the future and he accomplishes the future. It's already done in eternity, in his eternal mind. He can already see it. Verse 11, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I also do it. So God knows the future. He declares the future. He accomplishes the future. Uh, that's, that's so much more than somebody who has, you know, a crystal ball who's a fortune teller. You know, that kind of a person who knows the future. God doesn't just know the future. He declares the future. He says this is what is going to be, and that is what happens. God is the authority and power. He has the authority and power to bring about everything that he intends to happen. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. In other words, Solomon is saying nothing is left a chance with God. Nothing is left a chance. So everything he intends to happen happens. Whatever comes about, he intended to come about. And he says, and through that, I will accomplish my purpose. Nothing happens except my purpose. Now, I want you to be careful about this idea because there are some people who would say, well, if that's true, then, then my life is, I don't have any responsibility. My life is meaningless. But that's, that's not true, and we'll get into this a little bit later. But your, your eternity hangs on your submission to this God who is sovereign. Because he gives you the ability to kind of, if you, if you want to just run roughshod and say, you know what, I, I want to be a sovereign citizen. I want to do my own thing. God will allow you to do your own thing. But your eternity hangs on the fact that you have to choose who you're going to serve. Now, God is sovereign. He's sovereign over, na over nature. That's a good thing to know tonight. Psalm 147, verse 9. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. Verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth. His words run very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? And the church said, amen. amen. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. So God is sovereign over nature. What's going to be happening tonight and tomorrow? God is sovereign all over over all that. He's actually calling the shots. So there's no hurricane. There's no tornado over which God cannot say, be still. And if he doesn't stop it, there's a reason. There's a reason. No sparrow dies without God's knowledge. The Bible says that the hairs of our head are numbered. Okay? And so, I mean, that's, that's crazy. You know, number 22,468 just fell off of Pastor Soto's head. God knows the number. And it's not how, I mean, he's literally numbered every hair on my head. It's getting easier every day. <laughs> God is sovereign over nature. He actually uses nature to accomplish his will. He commanded a whale to swallow Jonah. Then he commanded a plant to grow and, and give Jonah shade later. And then he commanded a, a, a worm to destroy the plant, to scold Jonah for his bad attitude. I mean, this is how in control God really is. So now we got to go a little bit further because there's, there's more involved with, with nature and biological and physical things. That means that there's no virus. There's no cell that is really free. Okay? They're all subject to God. And if he wants it to stop, 
it's going to stop. Okay? So that, that includes disease and, and death. And I'm about to ruffle some feathers. But God even has, he is so sovereign that he has de- design in disability. He each actually has design in disability. Exodus 4.11. So the Lord said to him, this is talking to Moses. Moses just said, I can't talk. I have a speech impediment. Look at Jesus. Or look at God's words. Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? He's that sovereign that there's even divine design and intention in disability. Now, I know disability is not easy, but I think we need to know that God has purpose in it. That's how sovereign he is. 1 Peter 4.19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. If it is the will of God, it's better to suffer. So God decides if we suffer. God decides if we live. God decides if we die. Deuteronomy 32, uh, 39. Now see that I, even I am, he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. I'm talking to you about a big God. Not a domesticated God, but a God who is truly Lord over all, over everything. And this is why James instructs us in James chapter 4, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So we are supposed to live our lives understanding that God is sovereign. And really nothing is promised to us, but whatever happens to us as believers, it's happening with purpose. And divine intention. So I'm trying to tell you that the roll of the dice, the decision of a dictator, the death of the bird, the death of a star, when when the moment the caterpillar wraps itself in a cocoon, the suffering of saints, the disabilities, the catastrophe, God is sovereign over it all. God is sovereign all over all the affairs of mankind. Daniel 2.21, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Who's really in charge? God's in charge. You may not like who gets elected, but at the end of the day, you just need to know God's in charge. He's the one who sets up. He's the one who takes down. Proverbs 21 and 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Remember God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh didn't have a chance. God hardened his heart. And God used this dictator to bring about a deliverance for the Hebrew people. Psalms 33 and 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. So the UN can meet all they want to. 
and, and Putin can declare war and, and the United States Capitol, whatever happens there, decisions and legislations and laws, people, people can do whatever they want to do. But at the end of the day, we are at the back of God and the call of God. Amen. God is over all the affairs of men. We wouldn't even have a savior if God wasn't sovereign over the affairs of men. Acts 4, 27 and 28. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Herod and Pontius Pilate, they were just doing God's bidding. That's what was happening. And so we see the worst in the human condition when this sinless man is framed. And there's this mock trial, a trial. Jesus, who was sinless, blameless, was crucified. So they murdered this man. But were they out of God's control in doing that? They were at their worst, more in God's control than any other time in their life. Yeah, because in their greatest sin, God destroyed the power of sin. So why do we, in this modern world, resist the idea that God is sovereign? Why do we bristle at this? Well, in part, I think it's because we think we control the world. We think we control our world. We would rather believe that we control our own destiny. But the truth is, we would be a fool to try to exact power from God to control our life. And say, you know what? I, I'm going to do it my way. I, I'm not submitting to your plan, to your purpose. God invites us on a journey of a spirit-led life. He invites us and says, I know how to lead you. I'm, I'm here all the time. I'll never forsake you. Walk in the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I can keep you out of all, of, out of the ditch line. I can keep you out of the snares and the traps. If you just acknowledge me, surrender to me, let me empower you with my spirit. But there are people who do not want a sovereign God to lead their life. And it's crazy because he's infinite, but we are finite. He has all knowledge, and we've got like just, you know, just a little pinhole of the picture of what things are really all about. Okay? I, I don't want to be that person. I saw a hilarious video. There's a picture of a boy. He's sitting in the back seat. He is crying. And he goes, he's going, please, 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 please. And his mom declares from the front seat, she's, she's like, his, his sister just got her temps. And she's driving for the first time. She just got her temps, so she's driving for the first time. And her, her little brother in the back seat, is, he is seriously concerned about his life. And he's crying. He's like, please don't let anything happen. Please, please, please. Is God Lord over your life? Are you, if, if you're the one who's so smart and you got so much going on that you're not submitted to his word and his spirit and you're doing your own thing, I feel sorry for you. You ought to be crying like that boy in the back seat because you don't know how to drive in this world. But there is a God who has all knowledge and power who's just waiting for an invitation from you to say, Lord, be Lord over my life. This whole world spins because of your command. Everything that's happening in nature, God, you've got it all going on. You oversee kings and you oversee kingdoms. Who am I to rebel against the leadership of God? 
the serpent tempted Eve into thinking that God imposing his will on her was unfair. He got Eve to think that God's house rules were unfair. And we know that there's a certain element of, of human pride in that. Where, where we think, I can do better than God. When you choose a substance over God and his spirit, when you choose a substance in your life over God and his spirit, and you say, God, you don't have the power to direct my life, but I trust this substance to give me the peace and tranquility that I need. That is a trick of the enemy to tell you, God, I reject your house rules. I'm going to make up my own rules. I can be like God. I can bring my own peace. I can manufacture my own soundness of mind. Just that one gaze at pornography, that, that one toke on a, on, a, on a joint, whatever it is that we turn to, be, and, and, and this is the thing that we're asking to do for us that only God can do for us, you're, trying, you're saying, I can be sovereign. And you have this illusion that you're in control of your life. I've heard somebody say this recently, not from our church, but it's just kind of a thing people say. I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to bet on myself. In other words, I'm just going to make, the investment's going to be in me because I'm the person ultimately who's in charge. So I've got to resource me and prioritize me because I'm the key to unlocking my future. I'm going to bet on myself. Oh, you like to play the lottery. You're going to bet on yourself. Do you want to know what the odds are for that? You step into eternity betting on or believing on yourself, you have 0.0% chance betting on yourself. What do you know about what is beyond the veil of this life? What do you really know? What life raft can you build to ride the seas of eternity? What shelter will you build for your soul to live in in the habitat of heaven? You really have the capability of doing that? I'm trying to help somebody to understand we serve a big God who is worthy of our trust. We got to stop doing our own thing. We got to stop saying, start saying, Lord, you are sovereign. You've got it. I can trust you. I can put my life in your hands. Are you writing your own orientation manual for the second after you breathe your last breath? You got that all figured out? I can tell you, I don't have it figured out. I need God. I need God. There are many ways that God reveals his sovereignty. First of all, God reveals himself and his sovereignty in the Bible through titles. I don't have time to get into all of this, but he, you know, the Bible, he's the master builder. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's alpha and omega. He reveals himself as absolute ruler through his titles. God reveals himself and his sovereignty in the Bible through his promises. He makes promises nobody else can make. Like Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's a big promise. That's a big promise. God is literally saying there's not a loss, there's not a betrayal, there's not a crisis that is either decreed by God or allowed by God. This is, I'm talking about believers. For believers, whatever is allowed or decreed will work for ultimate good. A promise that could only be made by a sovereign God. Nobody else can make that promise. Only a sovereign God can make that promise. Look at this promise. This reveals the sovereignty of God. Philippians 2, 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
that's saying, I'm God all by myself. And there's going to be a point in time when every tongue will confess it. Every knee will bow. Everyone will know. There will be no debate. There will be no skeptics. There will be no critics. There will be no atheists. Everyone will know absolutely with total certainty that I am God. God reveals himself and his sovereignty in the Bible through prophecy. Prophecy. Daniel chapter 2, God promised kingdoms that would occur before it ever happened. I don't have time to get into it. Many of you would know about, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and the image that he dreamed about and that foretold the Babylonian Empire would be overthrown by the Medo-Persian Empire and, and, and the Medo-Persians would be conquered by the Greek Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. And, and, and God gives specific prophecy about nations, empires that would rise, empires that would fall. So specific is this prophecy that some critics even say there's no way that Daniel could have been written at that time. It was written after. But historians know that is not plausible. There's too much evidence regarding Daniel living in that time period. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God, and who can proclaim or prophesy as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. He's talking about everybody you think is God, Baal, whoever else you worship, have them talk about what's going to happen. If your God is so big, have them prophesy. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and I declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. We know that the sovereignty of God is revealed through Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 and 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. In other words, God orchestrated everything at the appropriate time. When the fullness of time had come, Jesus was born. It was a supernatural birth. We're talking about sovereignty here. Look at Jesus. It tells us there is a sovereign, all-powerful God. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, who is God manifest in flesh, said this of himself. Most, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus says in, in, in the scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. Verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, gives us a picture of the sovereignty of Almighty God. Now God, this is where I feel like if there's application time, I'm saying things, I'm trying to build your faith, I'm trying to reinforce the truth, textually support it. But if there's some take-home value to my message, it's in these next few moments. God reveals his sovereignty by redeeming the pain in our lives. In the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis unpacks some very core things in our understanding that we'll need in our Christian belief system, in our biblical worldview. Genesis starts it. And so we have these core doctrines of the creator, the core doctrine of the fall of man, we see that initial judgment in the flood. We see how new races came into being, how God chose Abraham, had a chosen people, and we learn about the patriarchs. But the last 13 chapters are about Joseph. 
I mean, if you read the book of Genesis and you're, you're looking at, like, the timeline of human history, it's like, shoo. I mean, we're getting through a lot of history in Genesis. But then it slows down to a snail's pace to unpack one life and to reveal one doctrinal truth that every believer needs to know and that God is sovereign enough to redeem the worst thing that's ever happened in your life. The story of Joseph. Beloved by his father. He's reviled by his brothers. Not anything that he's really done, but his father has created a rival culture in his own home. Joseph is a great young man. He's treated differently than his brothers. Joseph has a dream. It came from God, who is sovereign. If he speaks it, it's going to come to pass. And essentially, Joseph receives this word from God through a dream that he is going to be greater than his brothers and even his father, that at some point they're going to bow and revere him. And Joseph doesn't have the emotional intelligence to keep his mouth shut because there's a rival culture already. There's already trouble brewing. And he pushes his brothers over the edge with this declaration that he's had this dream. And they conspire, and they, they were going to kill him first, but then they saw an opportunity to make money, and they sold him into slavery. And he sold to Potiphar. And so now Joseph has no rights. He has, there's no way for him to uh, advocate for himself. There, he, there's no way for him to provide for himself. He's entirely at the mercy of a master. But Joseph is an excellent, good man who loves God. And he wins the confidence of Potiphar to the point that he just goes up through the ranks to the point that really he is number two over in Potiphar's house. And he oversees all the affairs of Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's house is blessed. And Potiphar's wife begins to lust after Joseph. I'm sure he was good looking. He had it all going on. Maybe they, they didn't have a great marriage. I don't know what the deal was, but she went after Joseph. And Joseph did not want to commit sin against uh, Potiphar or God. And so he ran out. She grabbed a hold of his coat, and he shook out of it, and he ran away. And she uh, didn't appreciate that. And so she lied and, and told Potiphar that, that Joseph tried to have his way with her, tried to force himself on her. Of course, Potiphar, I don't think Potiphar believed her. If Potiphar believed her, he would have had Joseph killed. There, was no, there is no legal system for slaves. In that culture. But to save face for his wife, he has him thrown into prison. And, and it's just like these a huge downward step. He, he just had some momentum going, and now he's in prison. And he's essentially, he's, he's forgotten for years. But he wins the confidence of jailers, and he becomes a leader among those who are incarcerated. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but if you, if you, if you think about... Uh, God's sovereignty, imagine the most powerful man in the world having a dream. And he cannot find, figure out what this dream means, but he knows their significance. And, and he threatens his, everybody around him, says, I got to know what this is all about. Somebody better tell me what this is about. And Joseph, who had been inmates, had been in, uh, incarcerated with two of Pharaoh's servants, um, one, of the, one of the serpents died in, in prison, was, was uh, hung, and then the other one was returned back to Pharaoh's house. And this man, upon hearing Joseph, uh, hearing that there was a need for an interpreter, remembered Joseph because Joseph had interpreted his dream. And he says, I know somebody who can interpret your dream. And in one day, one day, Joseph leaves the prison and walks into the palace. It changes everything. Joseph's dream is absolutely right. His dream, the interpretation, I should say, of the dream, saves Egypt in a seven-year famine and many other countries. And Pharaoh becomes insanely rich because he, he saved spoils. He saved 
crops for this time, and he had enough to even share with other countries, and I'm sure he was selling it at a premium. But because of that, Joseph's own family and brothers, they are affected by this, and so they hear that there's, there's food in Egypt, and they're led before their brother who they betrayed. Joseph knows who they are. They don't know who he is, and there is this recovery of their relationship. He forgives them. And so their relationship uh, allows them to have the favor of, of, of uh, Pharaoh. They're given a special land, the land of Goshen. They prosper there. They grow there. After some time, Joseph's father passes away, and Joseph's brothers are afraid. They're like, he didn't kill us because of our dad, but now he's going to kill us. And so Joseph's coming back home after burying his father, and they sent messengers and said, Dad had one last request. And that is that you don't do anything bad to us. And Joseph's just like shaking his head. This is pitiful, guys. You don't understand. It's over. I don't have any ill will towards you. And look what he says. We always go to verse 20, but look at verse 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? He's like, this, this, isn't a, this isn't about me. This is about God. I'm, I'm not going to judge you. God, God's responsible for everything that's happened here. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones and be comforted. Uh, and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph realized all that pain and all that difficulty that God sent him there to save Israel. God sent him there to save his family. And he said, guys, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, the reason why I'm going here with the last couple minutes that I have is because I know that sometimes I and you wonder at the sovereignty of God. And God's plan and purpose is not obvious. And some of the things that have happened to you might have happened to me or, or you've seen happen to somebody else was unexplainable. But all I can say is this, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter how unfair, no matter how painful, no matter how deep the wounds are in your heart, no matter the abuse, if you will submit to God, if you will submit your life to God, you will be able to say about those things Satan, you meant it for evil, but God is going to make it for good. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait around long enough, and I'm going to be faithful long enough to see God bring good out of this pain in my life. God is sovereign. Do you trust that? Do you believe that? Do you believe what the Bible says about the sovereignty of God? Do you believe it enough to trust him and not yourself and your inventions and your vices? To give you peace of mind? Or are you just going to do your own thing and build your own life raft for eternity? God is sovereign. And I believe as the musicians come, we have a responsibility to believe him, what he says about who he is and how big he is and what he can do with the worst things that have ever happened in our lives. We need to believe that. And then we need to obey what he tells us to do. Take him at his word. So God is sovereign, but there's an appropriate response to that as human beings with a free will. And that is to believe him and that is to obey him. And if you don't obey him, 
and you're doing your own thing, you have downsized God. And you're saying he is not who he says he is and declares himself to be. Because if you believed it, you would trust him. Would you stand with me? I want Brother Luke to come. He's going to give this altar call. I think each and every one of us need to take some time to stand in the presence of an amazing, omnipotent, powerful God. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> it's our custom here at ATC to come forward and respond to the preaching of the word. You know, it's, it's not very difficult to find, to find his sovereignty all throughout scripture. The very God who, who made death as a curse for sin went upon that cross and became sin himself for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And God said, I'm going to trade places with you because I'm so sovereign the very thing that is supposed to hold me down, I'm going to endure. And not only am I going to endure, but I'm going to overcome it. Because death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You've been conquered by the risen king. So yes, he did make death. In his sovereignty, he also overcame it. And he gave that power to us that we too can overcome death and that we can overcome everything that stands in our way because we serve a sovereign God. God, I ask that we can just tap into the supernatural tonight, that we can just tap into this place right now, God. God, because you're here because you're here God and when you're here the supernatural is birthed the supernatural comes forth God you're here because you want to be here you want to mend the broken heart you want to heal the hurting you want to heal all those who are going through pain and don't know how we can get through it but we know you're a sovereign God because the genuine, authentic, true, living God is in this room right now. And you can tap into him right now. You can get a hold of him right now. You can reach the sovereign God right now. If you're just willing to let him be the sovereign God in your life. In Jesus' name.